Alrighty, welcome back to the Reputation Revolution. My name is Trevor Young. Got a terrific guest today. We've got a massive topic that we're going to dissect. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, he, my guest today, uh, Forbes called him a podcasting advocate, uh, while Inc. Magazine dubbed him a unicorn level digital marketing expert. Uh, he's the founder of a, the Podcast Success Summit. And also, uh, he hosts the 360 Entrepreneur Podcast. His name is Jan Alunga, uh, all the way from Finland. Welcome, Jan. Trevor, hello. We were talking about this before we started connecting uh, this conversation. It's crazy because we have been connected for a few years. We have had some touch points here and there, but it's the first time that we sit down. And I have to admit that I'm honored to be sitting down with one of the heroes of Australian content marketing. So I'm really, really excited to be here. <laughs> uh, you're, you're too kind. And yes, we've been circling each other on social media. And I think that's what the wonderful thing about social, you know, we've just been, uh, before we hit record, uh, just gas bagging away, just yapping away. And, uh, you know, as if we know each other really well, and this is the very first time. So uh, I always, you know, try and implore people to get on social and, and make those connections and talk to people because it just, it, it's just like, you know, by the time you eventually meet, you know, you've had, it feels like you've had dozens of meetings before. So this will be a very uh, informal conversation because of that, because uh, we know each other so well, Yarn. Um, we're going to talk about a pretty big topic today. Uh, we'll we'll mm -hmm. call it content profits, um, because a lot of what we talk here at the Reputation Revolution is really about establishing a voice in the market, uh, enhancing the credibility of that voice through through content, extending the reach um, through and building your audience, and then extracting the value of the profile and the reputation that you do build. So we kind of fit across all of those things. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to build a profile and a reputation, you, of course, want to be able to commercialize it and extract the value from it. So let's tell us, before we go into anything, let's get a bit of a background from you because you are you know, doing a lot in podcasting, but it, you, you've extended well beyond that now. Uh, what's the thumbnail s sketch of your good self? <laughs> Absolutely, Trevor. And it's funny because you and I, well, aside from being two handsome men, <laughs> we share <laughs> quite many commonalities because I know that your background has been in communications too, and that's my background as well. That's what I studied at university at both bachelor and master's level. I have worked as a journalist, and as you said, I do a few different things. So I've been podcasting since 2014. To date, between my own podcasts, podcasts that I've helped clients with, I've produced over 400 episodes, most of which have been interviews with New York Times bestselling authors, top entrepreneur, Grammy Award winning artists. I do consulting in the podcasting space. I've been doing a lot of that. That's what I'm often known for. I've spoken at events, actually, I, as I told you a few years ago, at this time of the year, I was in Australia where I spoke at, the, at a podcasting conference and I have great fond memories of, of those times and of that trip. So podcasting is an area I'm working in. And then another area that I work in and I really, really love because I think podcasting, obviously, both from the hosting and guesting side of things is impactful. But I think the other area my business focuses on, which is lead generation with a particular attention to organic lead generation. Yeah. It's something that I think can, can, it's one of the pillars in my opinion for businesses, especially when it comes to consultants, to coaches, to solopreneurs. So those uh, in, a, in a nutshell are some of the things that I've been doing and that I'm doing these days. Terrific. And um, you said the word there, organic lead generation, which, oh, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people seem to think that, that those days of organic reach and, and lead gen are, are over and now you have to pay through the nose to the likes of, uh, of Facebook and <laughs> now TikTok and everyone else. Right. Uh, so we'll, we'll stick pretty much to the organic side of things. So when we talked about, you know, if we said, if we look at content profits and basically using content as a way you know, to to build our audience that we can then probably, you know, get uh, leads from, prospects. Uh, mm -hmm. They can, you know, of course, help us get our name out there as well and, and you know, sell products, services, whatever it is we're doing. So in that terms, when we're talking content, so we'll talk 
podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, video, YouTube videos, uh, and blogging. Let's keep it to those sort of three. Uh, in video, you might sort of also put live streaming. Do you want to sort of, is there sort of, can we just talk about them in general terms when we're talking, uh, when you build your platform, it's going to be one of those? Would that be a fair way to start? Yeah, absolutely. That That's a terrific statement. I couldn't have said it better myself. And for me personally, when it comes to this topic of content profits, I try to have a three-step approach that ties into what you were saying. So about content, about picking the quote unquote tried medium. The first step is identify, the second is attract, and then the third is engage and convert. And if you want, Trevor, before focusing on different mediums, I can briefly touch upon each of those. Let's break those down. Absolutely, go for it. So that we, perfect, so that we have kind of the foundation. So some of these things are pretty straightforward. However, sometimes we are so eager to focus on monetization, on growing our business, on acquiring new clients, that sometimes we forget about these steps and then we may be surprised that some things we're doing aren't working. We are frustrated because we aren't getting results. So let's take a quick look at them. Well, the first, it's obviously under the first step, identify is to think about who are you helping? And this is, as I said, it's pretty straightforward. So this is your ideal customer profile. You'd wanna think about the content that you choose. And I know, Trevor, I made a note here because I know you have discussed the content model where there is the utility content, that it's more educational, leadership content, that it's about inspiring people to see the bigger picture. You have the branded content that typically should be between 10 to 20% of our content output. And then human content that has the purpose of making our brand feel more relatable. And as you say, as you discuss in your content, Ideally, our content should be at the intersection of, of those four areas, yes. and I agree 100%. So when we're thinking about who we are helping, we need to think about the ideal customer profile or customer avatar. We need to think about the content, and we also need to already incorporate optimization into this. So everything we have in terms of our digital real estate, our online presence, needs to be optimized. So that can be our LinkedIn profile, that can be the description of our YouTube channel, it could be the, the website, obviously, that we're using. Everything should be optimized. So SEO, for example, goes in that direction. So the who we're helping is the first thing to consider. Then, obviously, it's about the what are we helping them with. So this is about their, their pain points that we are helping them solve, things that we, that we teach and things that people can learn both through our content as well as through working with us. And then the how we are helping. This is where we're going more in the direction of choosing the different medium. Yep. So is it a blog? Is it a podcast? Is it a, a YouTube channel, for example? Now, the first thing when it comes to picking the right platform or the, the most appropriate medium is to look at your audience. And again, also this is pretty straightforward. So who are you targeting and where are they spending time on? How do they inform themselves? How do they consume content? Is it video? Is it written? Is it video? So start from that. Then you want to look at how you feel or what type of content you feel the most comfortable producing. Yeah. Practical example, if you're terrified of being on camera, I wouldn't say you need to use video, you need to use video. I would say, all right, if you aren't using video, you are missing out on opportunities. That's just a fact. However, it doesn't mean that you can't leverage content to attract prospects. So after you have looked at where your ideal customers are, are spending time, how to inform themselves and so forth, and you've looked at how you feel the most comfortable with, then it's time to actually look at the strengths of each medium. And is it okay for you, Trevor, if I focus on video and audio? Yep, let's go with that. Awesome. And then I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on, on what I'm about to say. So the main advantage, if we compare written content, we, we compare that to audio content to video content, and I'm gonna even throw visual content into the mix. So things like infographics and slide decks, for example. Yep. The differentiating factor that audio content has, 
podcasts are an example of that. Audiobooks could be another example. Is the fact that the content consumption experience can be incorporated into almost any routine a person has. What does that mean? It means that they can consume your content while they're walking their dog, they're exercising, they're jogging, they're driving, they're grocery shopping, they're cooking, without having to interrupt what they're doing. That isn't possible with other forms of content. I mean, if you think about it, if you watch a video, you read a blog post, an email, whatever, you, your attention need to be uh, focused on the screen if you're using a, a device. Whereas with audio, you just need some headphones and you're good to go. So that's a huge advantage because it makes or it increases the chances of people diving deeper into your content because somebody may go on a two hour road trip and they may say, oh, I'm going to listen to Reputation Revolution, my favorite show, and they're going to listen to it for a couple of hours. Whereas with reading a blog post, for example, they may read it for a minute, yeah. five minutes, if we are really, really lucky, yeah. and then they may leave. Yeah. So that's an adventure, advantage that audio has compared to other medium. What do you think, uh, Trevor, since I know you have been using different types of content and, and tapped into different mediums? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I certainly agree with you, whatever you're the most comfortable with. I mean, if you're someone who really is a good writer and loves the art of writing, then that's going to be your strength. Um, I know people that you know, love chatting but would never get in front of a camera and those who just eat up the camera and love that. So <laughs> that's always the best one. I guess where your audience is today, they're kind of everywhere and that's probably the really hardest thing to discern uh, because mm -hmm. people are taking in information in different ways. Uh, people learn in different ways, of course. Um, and I think, I think I like the idea of having a content hub and that's, let's call it a blog, but a blog today doesn't need to be written because you can put all your audio, yeah. you know, like your show notes from a, from a podcast episode, but the, the actual podcast mm -hmm. is embedded in it. Uh, of course, all your YouTube videos. And if you've done live streaming, uh, I did a live streaming yesterday on LinkedIn, so I can now, um, download that. It's already on LinkedIn. I download the video. I can put it up on a will. Haven't yet. <laughs> put it up on YouTube, and then I can put the YouTube into a blog post. So there's those sorts of things. But I, I kind of, I'm with you on the audio. I think you've, you know, if people are listening to you, if people are listening to this, <laughs> and you know, it, and where in their ears, um, and and you know, they they might be doing something else, but they're they're still listening. That is a really privileged place to be. Uh, whereas we know if they're watching a YouTube video. Um, you know, there's every chance they could be doing other things at the same time, but they all serve a purpose. But I think video, I think audio has got, um, you know, we haven't even really scratched the surface with audio and what we can do. We think podcasts, but there's a lot of other ways we can use audio, isn't it? Audio books, you know, there's no reason why people can't create a series of mini audio books. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And when it comes to the power of audio, when it comes especially to content consumption, I always share an example. Now, <laughs> this is a disclaimer. It's the only time I've gotten this type of email in my career, and I'm not sure I will ever get this type of email again. But years ago, I got an email from a listener of one of my shows, The Jazz Spotlight, which is a music business podcast. And, well, I don't remember all the email verbatim, but basically... She said, I wanted to say thank you because I went on a 12-hour road trip and you were with me the entire time because I listened <laughs> to a few episodes of the Jazz Spotlight. Now, I think not even my parents could stand listening to me for <laughs> two hours, let alone 12. But if we think about the so-called no like and trust factor, if we think about my brand being more human, more relatable, think of how powerful those 12 hours were as I was listening to, uh, uh, sorry, as she was listening to me and I had different guests, but I was the common denominator as the host because I was always there. Of course. So that was a very, very powerful thing. As I said, that's really an exception, but it speaks to the idea of how easy it is for people to take us with them or rather take our content with them. And that's harder to do with written and video. Yeah, it is. Now, Trevor, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and on top of the know, like, and trust where, you know, that that's clearly, you know, very important, but I also add into that um, being um, 
being talked about in a positive way and and mm. and also the visibility you're there all the time so you know you liked you trusted you're front of mind and you're being talked about in a positive way because i think being front of mind today is probably the biggest challenge we have when there's so much noise so front of mind to me and that's my uh, old pr background coming out that's the biggest <laughs> challenge to do it respectfully without shouting at people and for people to subscribe to your information. So whether you're blogging, uh, live streaming, doing YouTube videos or a podcast like this or even running a newsletter, for people to subscribe to you, uh, I think, again, is another I use the word privileged position to be. And I think that that's, you know, that's that's a very powerful um, thing for us um, as content creators. Uh, I, I agree. I second every word you said, Trevor, especially I like the, the fact that you use the word privilege, because I think when we think of being in somebody's earbud, being in somebody's newsletter, yep. being in somebody's playlist of videos to watch as a privilege, then that comes with a greater sense of responsibility. So we are more likely to really pay attention to everything we do and to really focus on serving people, helping people versus just, as you said, just to shout at them or just try to, to push the latest product we are about to launch and we just want to push that in the most salesy and annoying way possible. Now, I know people may be like, well, Trevor, thanks a lot. You brought a guy who works in the podcasting space. So obviously he's going to praise all your content. Hold your horses because even though I've been a podcaster for a few years, I'm actually a huge fan of video content. In fact, that's actually the medium I'm focusing on the most these days. And why is that? True, people can't, well, technically they can consume video as they're doing other things if they just listen to it. For example, I know I listen to a lot of content on YouTube, so I just play the video, put the phone in my pocket and I listen to it. It's video content and if there is something important, I quickly pull out my phone and look at the screen to see what is it that they're showing. But the main powerful aspects of video, and this isn't something that any other medium has, and that's something in favor of using video for your business, is what my friend, colleague and client, Connie Steele, whom I've co-produced a corporate podcasting video series with calls Record Once, Syndicate Many. And yeah. you touched upon this, Trevor, earlier when you were talking about the fact that you have done a LinkedIn live stream yesterday. You can download the video. You can up upload it to YouTube. You can use the video in other spaces on other platforms and that's the idea of the record once syndicate many principle is that you can take one piece of content a video and try to think of it as a fruit i'm a, I'm a foodie trevor so i, <laughs> I like to make food metaphors <laughs> try to think of trying to squeeze the fruit to get as much content juice as possible yeah. so practical example the live stream you did yesterday on linkedin we could take that. Let's say it's a 15 minute long video. We could take that. We could take a few clips from that video. It can be some highlights, some key steps you shared. They can be 30 seconds long or maybe a couple of minutes long. So we can have several of those yep. as clips. We can take the same clips and turn them into audiograms. Yep. We can take the same clips and turn them into written quotes. We can use tools to make them visually appealing, visually attracting, but you get the idea. Yeah. We can have an article based out of the video. We can even have a series of articles yeah. based out of the video. If you discussed, let's say, a five-step process in the video, we could have five articles, That's right. each of which discusses one of the five steps. So it could be a five-part series. So video content is powerful because it enables you when approached strategically to create a content engine and a system that in, lets you put in the work once with, crea with creating the one piece of content, say a video, and then get a lot more repurposed pieces of content, micro pieces of content that we can use so that we are, as you said earlier, Trevor, we can be top of mind with those we're trying to reach regardless of where they are, whether it's LinkedIn, yep. whether it's a specific forum, a specific community, YouTube, and so forth. So that's what I would say when it comes to, to video. Trevor, you, I mean, you use video yourself a ton. 
So what are your thoughts in, in terms of video? Yeah, I mean, I, I love videos because we can see the whites of people's eyes. Um, I do like lives <laughs> because um, there's not as many people doing it because clearly, you know, <laughs> it's easy to stuff up. Um, but the, the good thing with live, I think, and, and, and it's not that everyone will watch you live, you know, like it, depending when mm -hmm. I went live yesterday, I went at a really bad time, but I get the views later and I can go, I use a yep. tool called StreamYard. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook Live. I haven't connected up YouTube yet, but that's also you can do that. And the fact that you can go out onto four, five, even more channels live from wherever you are is just, it knocks me out. It knocks me around. It just blows me away. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can do that today and that we have that technology. But if we use that one as an example, so I do a live, it's on LinkedIn and I'm on Facebook and Twitter. So I've got that covered. I put it up on YouTube, and then the, I, I've already I actually have written an article on the topic, um, which I promoted yesterday as well. It was a this was the topic about LinkedIn newsletters. So I saw all, it. <laughs> all yesterday was about LinkedIn newsletters, and so then I can I haven't yet, but I'll put that uh, YouTube video across into that article, so it's an article or people can read. Um, the the live was about thirteen or fourteen minutes. Then I can take, and I probably will take the audio and put it up as a podcast. And mm -hmm. as you said, in the video, you can cut snippets out and you can, you know, I could dot them out across, you know, a number of weeks and uh, they could be, you know, up to a minute or whatever. And that can go onto Instagram if they're under a minute. So all of those things. And then if there's some quotes, I can take the quotes out and put them in as little, you know, micro posts uh, on all, yeah. so, all sorts of social channels. So that's the idea of when people say, well, it takes a long time to do content. Yes, it does. But if you, as you said, squeeze a lot out of the, out of the squeeze the juice out of it, uh, out of the big, so think long form, and then that long form can be cut mm -hmm. and sliced and diced into so many ways. So that's where video is good because you've got that extra, extra oomph, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And obviously it does take practice because depending on the type of content you create, the type of topic you discuss, yeah. you need to be mindful of the fact that if you plan on repurposing a video, you may repurpose it in audio-only form. So if you are showing something in your video, yeah. then somebody listening to it may be like, okay, where am I going to see what he or she is discussing? Correct. So that's something that it's important to keep in mind that if you plan on repurposing your content, you need to be mindful of the fact that the context you are in, meaning creating video, may not be the same context a listener or a reader Correct. are going to consume the repurposed pieces of content in. So it's important to keep that in mind. But as you said, we can, sure, it does take time. Well, first of all, creating content in general, creating good quality content takes time. But if we are strategic, we can get a lot out of this. So uh, these are some of the considerations for the first step, they identify. And then one final thing there, obviously, you want to think about how you're helping people, both in terms of your content, but also with your products and services. And for me, one thing I do, uh, Trevor, I have clients, people in my community, friends, colleagues, who some of them say, well, I don't like selling. I have a hard time. You know, I don't like to be promotional. And I say, I always try to shift the focus from the price tag itself. If you're a person who identifies with what I just said, here's a, a tip for you. Shift the focus from the price tag and sales to helping people. So practical example, if you go to the pharmacy, it's one thing to buy something like an aspirin if you have a headache, which helps you make the headache pass in, in a short window of time versus taking an antibiotic that unfortunately you may have to take for several days or a couple of weeks or to go back to food as a foodie, it's very different having an appetizer at a restaurant or having a three course meal. So when you start to think of it that way, you can see the difference between helping people with an aspirin or an appetizer, which is something that doesn't take you a lot of time to create doesn't take a lot of time for them to consume, helps them quickly, and therefore may have a relatively low price tag. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have a three-course meal, three meal where it may take a longer time, it has more, more food, it costs more, and so forth. So always try to focus on 
the help you provide people with and that is going to help you then when it comes to selling because i always say that if you have a product or a service that can help people and you aren't promoting it you're actually making people a disservice because you're preventing people who could benefit from the help that product or service would give them from getting access to that so if you aren't selling or sorry, if you aren't promoting something you're selling for whatever reasons, remember that you're not helping people who could be helped yep. with that product yep. and service. And it's interesting here. There's a couple of things I want to jump in with. There's there's two ways mm -hmm. to look at this too. A lot of people who are doing... So the audience that we strive to get here on the Reputation Revolution, the people who I know uh, listen to the show, it's very much about people who have been in the trenches for the professional trenches for quite some time. They've got lots of expertise. Mm -hmm. They've got the, you know, the scars on the knuckles to prove the fact they've been around a bit, <laughs> lots of experience and, and, you know, been around for a few decades. And they're the types of people that are less likely to put themselves out there than, you know, someone who's a digital native and knows, understands marketing and the social media world and they can craft themselves really good, but there's probably not much depth there because they haven't got the years of experience. So if we look at the people who are, you know, the professional experts and chances are they're, they're probably, I mean, they could be working for someone else or they, chances are they're running their own business now. They've already got their sort of products and services in place and then they're using content like traditional content marketing, I suppose we'd call it, to, yeah. to, you know, to, to attract people to their brand and, and that's when the sales process starts and um, you know, the know, like, trust, front of mind, all of that sort of stuff. But I also like looking, uh, Jan, at the, um, the, the independent cr content creators or the creator mm -hmm. economy that we, we keep hearing about at the moment yeah. and been really studying that for a number of years now. And now it's, it's huge. And that's where people are building an audience with no monetization at all. And then they work out what the audience wants and monetizes it. And, and then they, pr they, they create products and services around that. And I think that there's a, a way to look at how you can learn from both of those um, sorts of things. You know, if you're a, you're running a business and it's more of a traditional consulting uh, or advisory business or you're coaching or whatever, what you should probably also be looking at what these content creators are doing and how they're creating courses and programs and, and doing events right. and be becoming speakers and stuff like that. So... It's. I think what you're saying is right. You can you can start monetizing it in different ways, and it's not just being the traditional, you know, consulting, which is a high end ticket, often. Mm -hmm. But you know, you could have smaller programs, as you said, that you know people might might be an audio book, for example, as a as a way in. Right. What's your thought about that? Was a bit of a, a broad brush riff on um, on the monetization <laughs> of a personal brand. But what's your take on on all of that side of things? Yeah, especially the latest point you made, I think it's very important because sometimes when people think of monetization, we have tunnel vision. So we may not look at opportunities that would help us monetize more efficiently. And for me personally, I think the easiest way to look at that is how you spend your time. So things like consulting, like coaching, as you said, typically they are on the high end of the spectrum. And they're ter terrific. I'm a consultant myself. I love my consulting work. However, the main downside of those is that when I'm sitting with a client having a consulting call, I'm not able to do anything else, obviously, because my time, my focus, my attention is all dedicated to that. So if I'm thinking about monetizing, if I'm thinking about growing my business, tapping into other forms of monetization that don't require me to be physically involved, it's huge. So as you said, there is a long list of those courses fall under that category, books, eBooks, paid webinars and digital workshops, virtual summits, you name it. So it's important for me personally, I think it's important to try to, especially if you are a coach or consultant, sure, to focus on your consulting and coaching services, but also try to productize those so that you are able to scale in that 
you are able to provide some of the help you provide clients with, yeah. perhaps on a on a smaller scale, because yeah. you may not in a course you may not provide everything you provide through your one on one or group coaching work. However, you're still helping people in a way that allows you to basically communicate to an audience without having to physically be there. So think of something like a pre-recorded course that people can just get access to and start consuming right away while you're doing something that has nothing to do with the course. Perhaps you're working, you're taking some time off, listening to live music, as we were discussing earlier, Trevor, or whatever the case may be. So I think this has been a very fun conversation and we have talked about step one, which was identify. And now the two remaining steps are actually for me personally, the most fun and interesting ones. The, the second step of this three step approach when it comes to content profits has to do with attracting prospects and lead generation falls into that category. Yep. You have on one side, you have outbound, which is to simplify things. Outbound is you reaching out to people and inbound is them being attracted and reaching out to you. Perhaps they come across your LinkedIn live stream and then they start to follow you and so forth. And then they get in touch with you to ask you questions and things like that. Now, when it comes to lead generation, I find it fascinating that some people who are in the paid advertising space, the main critique they have toward organic is well, you can't predict it with accuracy. With paid advertising, you can create a system where you put in $1 and you make $2. Hmm. Well, I, I have nothing against paid advertising. However, I don't think that the statement is accurate because it is possible to create a system that enables you to track with pretty good accuracy key performance indicators, important numbers. So how do you actually do that? That's not that difficult. What you need to do is to start to think of, okay, what is the financial goal I want to hit? Can be monthly, can be quarterly, that's up to you. So you start with that. Yep. Let's say, let's take a monthly one. Then you need to look at the average deal size. So if you're a coach, typically, what are the coaching packages you sell going for? Okay, now that you have your goal, now to, that you know the average price tag of a coaching package, you need to do the math and say, okay, how many of these do I need to sell yep. in order to hit my monthly goal? Great. Now you know that. Then you walk down the scale and you say, okay, how many of these, uh, sorry, how many, if you have calls with people, if calls is your way to convert prospects into customers, you need to look at what are your conversion rates. So in other words, when you're having calls with prospects, Typically, how many of those are you able to convert into customers? Now you have a number. Then you need to look at, okay, when I reach out to people, for example, in my outbound lead generation, how many of those touch points, of those contacts, I'm able to convert to appointments? So remember, we started with our monetary goal, then we looked at the average deal size, yep. then we looked at the number of appointments we convert into clients. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at the number of connections, prospects, we turn into appointments. And then once you know that, you look at, okay, how many touch points do I need to make on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis or on a deal basis so that I get to this number of appointments so that then I can get this number of conversions, I can get these uh, deals and so forth. So. Once you do that, you are going to be able to have a system that enables you to easily calculate what is it that you need to do. And I love the term activity-based selling, which I've learned from, from Kai Davis. And the idea of activity-based selling is that you focus on steps you need to carry out to achieve results. So once you have those numbers, it's just about actually doing the work. And whether it's you or it's an assistant your team, it doesn't really matter who is doing the work. But when somebody says, well, with organic, you can't really have accuracy in terms of what you need to do to, to achieve results. That's a statement that in my opinion, isn't that accurate. What are your thoughts, Trevor? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's you've got the inbound and the and the outbound, and of course, the outbound you can only do so much because people don't like to be contacted, etc. The inbound yeah. is the is the powerful one because if someone's coming to you, um, they've already you know potentially done their homework, um, right. and as we know, that's that's incredibly important, and that's why, um, and 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 I'm not the anti paid. Uh, paid social, paid media as well. But I, I'm a believer that you build your brand and your reputation again and again, 365 days of the year, and that that just continues to build. And then you put the digital marketing, the paid space on top of that, um, mm -hmm. and it's going to make it work harder because hopefully people have already heard of you or if they go to check you out, there's validation that, okay, these guys, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why I'm very much about that organic build that base of owned earned social media build that audience organically and then put the paid on top. The, only, the problem is people go straight to the paid and they've got nothing underneath. There's no foundations. Exactly. And so probably what we've talked about today is really putting those foundations in and and when we look at foundations, you know, content is a big part of that. And the bigger the profile and the reputation. Your front of mind, people are talking about you, all of that sort of stuff. Well, then the bigger that becomes, and the more that you do that on a cons it's all about consistency, isn't it? Fronting up, showing up, mm -hmm. adding value, all of that, the less you'll have to pitch is the way I look at it. So, Absolutely. you know, today we're talking about using content, or well, we're talking about content profits, but the profits come from the content and the, the base you build, the audience you build, the trust and the likability and the visibility you build. That would be my exactly. summation. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, and the third step, engage and convert, is actually tied into what you just said. In other words, for conversions to happen, everything needs to be connected. So whatever it is that you're selling needs to be connected to pain points your target market has. That's pretty straightforward because otherwise nobody's going to be interested in buying what you sell. Content you create needs to revolve around those as well. And that's where you can create systems. So for example, for podcasting or even for video, always be strategic. So practical examples. If you're somebody who does guesting, then think of what are my areas of expertise? What are topics I'm passionate about discussing? What are topics that are of use to my customers, to my community, and to audiences I'm trying to reach through interviews as a guest? Then what you want to do is, all right, what can I offer people as a next step? So when somebody has finished listening to, to me or to me and the host, what is the next step they can take so that they can continue with what they've learned in this podcast or they can put into practice what they have learned. And there are a few different ways you can do that. I typically try to direct people toward a specific page and depending on the context, the page may be, may be different. And there are different ways to do this. I use a tool called HYAX, H-Y-A-X, which I recently started using i've used it over the last couple of months but it's fantastic and i'm trying to leverage it more for my business because it does a lot of things but the idea is like in our case trevor we are talking about content profits and that's something that i know that people can not just listen to us now and be like okay boom i'm done now i know everything i need to 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 know about this well, not really, because it's quite the topic and there are steps that need to be addressed, need to be taken. And depending on where you are in your journey, you may need more or less work. Work is needed regardless. But the point here is that if I want to make sure that you have been here with Trevor, with myself, not only you've enjoyed yourself, but you actually want to make this work for your business, then you need to take action. But I think the idea here of creating systems is to start to look at the type of medium you tap in the most. Is it content you create? Is it content you contribute to as a guest? Yep. Think of podcast guest interviews, for example. And then you want to create a system that takes people almost literally by the hand and directs them in the direction they need to go to to actually implement what is it it is that you teach them. How do you do that? There are a few different ways. 
A very simple one is to have a landing page that invites them to get access to a resource, like in this case, a toolkit, for example. And then you may have an email sequence that provides them with additional advice related to the topic. Per perhaps it shows them how to best utilize the resource they have downloaded. And then that email sequence may direct people toward a next step you have. It can be another free resource, a paid course you have, a challenge, a webinar, whatever the case may be. In other cases, it may be to have people actually hop on a call with you. Mm -hmm. So if discovery calls are a way you use to get to know your market better, to have conversations, to turn people into, or prospects into customers, then you may want to direct people toward a page where they can pick a, a time, well, a date and a time for yeah. a discovery call. If you enjoy teaching, then the next step may be something like having people sign up for a webinar, a digital workshop, a five-day challenge, a mini virtual summit, or things of that nature. You want to make sure, I think the key word when it comes to content profits isn't so much systems, rather is connection. If what your products and services address is connected to the next steps you provide and those next steps are connected to the content you've been part of or you have created and that content is connected to the main topics people you're trying to reach are interested in, then the steps are gonna take place. So you wanna start from the end and then you wanna reverse engineer the steps. So think of what is it that you help people with, how do you help them with, and, and then reverse engineer and, and think, oh, before they get to this huge challenge, hmm. what are some other smaller challenges that they face along, along the way? And how can I help them uh, overcome those obstacles. So I think that it's important to, if you're using discovery calls, then it's important that you have a, an appointment booking system and it doesn't have to be super complicated. You mm -hmm. can use a scheduling tool like Book Like a Boss, which I use, uh, Acuity Scheduling, Calendly. Another one I'm a fan of is called Sidekick AI. Something like that, very simple. You can even embed that calendar on a, on a page so that you have control over what's on that page and have people go with that. If you prefer actually showcasing your expertise through teaching, then you wanna have a system that revolves around a teaching asset like a webinar. Yep. If you are a very good writer or you're good on camera, then you may wanna have a system that taps into email sequences, perhaps even featuring video. And if video is something you enjoy doing, you may even want to look into the art tools you can use to create and send personalized video. One is called SendSpark and the other one, both of which I'm a huge fan of, is called Hippo Video. So I know uh, this is a topic that we could be here the entire month discussing, Trevor, but I think that it's important when it comes to systematizing what we do to think of what is it that we're helping people with, what is it that we're selling, what is our best conversion asset. So is it a discovery call almost straight to the point because we are so good that we don't need to do a lot of nurturing? Is it teaching, showcasing our teaching expertise through something like a webinar, a digital workshop? Is it through written content? Think of email sequences or is it even something else? Perhaps it's something else. You invite people to join your Facebook group because in there you do daily live streams or weekly live streams yeah. and that's your way of then converting people into from, from Facebook group members into something else and you have them take the next step that is going from your Facebook group to something else. Think of a discovery call, for example. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there and I think there's a couple of things to look at too because um, you know that it requires people giving an email address so you've got to give a fair bit of value today to get that email mm -hmm. address and people might listen to you for a quite a long time before they actually make a decision um, it's got to be yeah. right for them at the time 
Um, and, and some people will be on your email list for years and years and years. Um, I heard of uh, one of my friends who runs a, uh, an online writing school and she told me the story once that um, someone was getting their newsletter for seven years and then she was ready. <laughs> so it, it, <laughs> it, is a, it is a pipeline really that you've got to, you know, got, got to uh, always be, be filling. But I think one thing I'll also say there is if you really want to get the content going and, and sometimes people over plan their content and they want it perfected. Yeah. And, and, you know, yes, you want it professional and good and all of that sort of stuff, but don't let perfection get in the way of getting it done. Um, sometimes it's better to get going uh, and take action and then you can work out your steps a little bit and, you know, pivot a little bit or whatever. But, uh, you know, if you're going to do a podcast, you know, yes, you know your audience, just get going into it. Don't worry too much about the call to action straight away because you you've got time to work that out. Get built, get start building your audience, and then start putting in these other elements. Uh, and maybe you you build your audience, and you find out a bit more about what they want as well. That you get that information back um, yeah. is another way of doing it. So I think I think the clear message, uh, Jan, is so uh, you know all of these parts work together. So you know you need mm -hmm. the owned media asset, <laughs> which is our jargon, isn't it? That's the oh, yeah. the podcast, the newsletter, the blog. Uh, the video um, have one home base, and you know, of course, you can repurpose to to reach different um, people in different um, social channels. And then you've got to build that audience, build that you know, likability, trust, resonance, and all of that. Then hopefully mm -hmm. you've got an offer. Um, could be a free offer, could be a paid offer, whatever that people are are willing to uh, indulge you in. And uh, but at the very worst, I think is getting them on uh, as a subscriber. And uh, once the, as a subscriber and you've, you're, uh, you know, continuing to deliver value and uh, you're cutting through the noise. I think that's it. When you have got something to sell um, oh, yeah. that hopefully it, it, um, it ticks the right box at the right time. Yeah. And I, and I think you, you said it, it's important to provide value and we don't need to get confused and think that providing value needs to be something super sophisticated with all the bezel whistles. Practical example, if I look at my business, Trevor, of the different uh, lead magnets I have, one of the highest converting one, I always laugh when I say this because it's, it's so simple, yet it works like a charm. It's very basic. I did years ago a podcast episode where I shared uh, the approach I have when it comes to inviting people to be guests on my podcast. And then I, need, I did another one where I shared how I approach when I want to be a guest and I reach out to podcast hosts. So the downloadable resource is the email template that I use. So I use a template and then I quickly customize it. This is maybe a four or five sentences email, which I read word by word on the podcast. And that's the one of the most converting downloadable resources I have of my entire business because mm -hmm. basically the idea, the next step is, hey, you heard me say this, now go and download your copy so that you can literally copy and paste it and customize it in a matter of seconds. And people just say, oh, this is really practical because I don't need to put in all the work from the start. And it's literally a one page PDF. So it doesn't have particular bells, whistles, music, <laughs> none of that stuff, and it works well. Why? Because it's connected to the topic that was discussed on the podcast episode and is a next step that enables people to put into practice what they learned into the podcast episode. So when it comes to value, we shouldn't mix value with thinking, oh, we need to create an ebook that is 500 page long and has yeah. a very nice cover and has a ton of infographics. None of that stuff matter. Always thinks of what is it that you help people with? What is it that you're discussing in a particular context? Let's say a podcast episode or a video. Yeah. And what is a next step that you can offer them that A, is connected to what was discussed and B, enables them to put into practice what they learned through that piece of content. And the, the connecting tissue here is uh, email. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, being able to automate. And, and, and I think what we're talking about here too, I mean, when people hear automation and automation is, can be done very badly, but I think oh, yeah. as long as you're, 
you know, your intentions are good, your heart is pure, you have generous spirit, all of that sort of stuff, then it's going to work into your favour. I mean, if you're just going to, mm -hmm. you know, grow a list and abuse it, <laughs> and we, <laughs> we've all been on the list, on the on the receiving end of uh, someone who's abused their uh, uh, the trust of their people in an email list, um, you know, you, you're going to get what's coming to you, and that means unsubscribe. Yeah. But uh, exactly. if you want to keep people going for the long term, um, you know, that relationship you build over a period of time is... Is, is terrific and um, and then when people are ready to buy they'll probably do it but um, it's a matter of not expecting that sale straight away either because it's sometimes it's a long gestation period as well yeah and I think one thing if, if you allow me Trevor 30 seconds to go on a short trend when it comes to the point you made one huge mistake that we make often is we focus so much on client acquisition acquisition clients 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 that we get tunnel vision yeah. And we overlook other things. Practical example, I may think, oh, I want to connect with Trevor and I want to convert him into a client. And then we're having a conversation and I realize that you're not a good fit. And I'm thinking, oh, well, that's a waste of time. I need to cut this short. And that's a huge mistake. Why? Because while it's true that somebody may be on our email list, for example, and they may not be an ideal fit in terms of client, they can be a perfect source of referrals for of our course. business. Yeah. Or they may be somebody who are the gatekeepers, let's say, to our community mm. that is filled with ideal customers for what we are doing, for the message we have and for the products and services we sell. So that person, through something like an interview or a collaboration, could give us access to that community. So it's important to keep in mind that when you are interacting with people, and it doesn't matter who you're interacting with, and you may think, ah, oh, I want, I need customers, remember that each person has value to offer and it's not that if a person isn't a good fit in terms of becoming a client is a person that you should forget about because yeah. they can be great opportunities that come even from people who actually aren't a good fit in terms of becoming clients of yours i said referrals collaborations <coughs> getting us access to the to their communities are things that are very very powerful that mm. drive business and that they shouldn't be ignored yeah terrific point I, i've yeah i've I've often said that you know not everyone's going to be your client, but everyone can be an influencer. <laughs> so oh, it, amen. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's a hundred percent right, and it's it's kind of like you know when you the old style. We haven't had them for a while, have we? The old networking events. <laughs> and, oh and, yeah. You know, well, what are those? <laughs> yeah, if someone comes up to you, they start talking. They're looking over your shoulder. And, you know, they're not even listening to you. They're looking for the next one and the next one and. Uh, they're, they're collecting business cards, basically, and, you know, they, they, those days are gone. Those days are well and truly gone, and uh, you never know who will become a client, who will become a referral of a client, um, who will share your stuff and who's in their networks. I mean, it's just ongoing, and, and we talk often, don't we, in social media about the lurkers, and uh, right. I often talk about this on LinkedIn, and we always have good conversations around it, and, you know most people will not comment or do anything. They'll just lurk and they'll watch and they'll take note. And, you know, and then one day they'll pop up and say, oh, I've been following you for years, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you say, oh, I don't even know who you are. And, um, you know, when probably on LinkedIn and the likes of that, 1% of people actually create content and something like 10% um, will comment or like or share or whatever. That leaves 90% of people who are uh, lovingly, we call them lurkers, uh, who are just sitting back and taking note and uh, never, yeah. ever, ever underestimate them because I've, you've probably been on the receiving end of some great opportunities from these people. I've certainly had speaking gigs and brand ambassador mm -hmm. gigs and consulting and coaching gigs, all from people who I did not know, but had been following uh, my videos and the content, and et cetera. So that's in a yep. similar vein, um, you know, always be delivering value. You never know who's looking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's not because somebody isn't engaging that it means that they aren't paying attention that's to, right. to your content, to your message. Very true. Um, you're right. We could, we could uh, keep this going for a long time. We better sort of start tying a few bows around it and wrapping it up. Alrighty, where do people find you? Do you want them to get you on LinkedIn, Twitter, go to your website? Thank you. So if you go to yanilunga.com, and I know that's a difficult spelling, it's Y-A-N-N, -N, 
I-L-U-N-G-A, so yanilunga.com, all one word. 